Welcome to Chapter 3. In this section, we will be looking at the years 1973 to 1993. We will examine the club's performance in the new SRU league structure, experiencing the highs and lows of competitive amateur rugby. We'll also see the introduction of the youth system into the club, touring and also improving facilities at Stony Hill. My first game was against Leith Ackies at the old Meadowbank Stadium. I can't remember the score, but the match was memorable for me because I met my long-term best friend, Peter Cassidy, and Bill Hogg, the bagman selector. Bill's contribution to the club over many years was recognised by the dedication of the Bill Hogg Room in the clubhouse. Being a member of the club has for me been like being part of an extended family where no one is excluded and friendships have been made and endured for over 50 years. I would hope that our club would remain true to its long-held interests of providing rugby in the community for all ages, abilities and genders in a competitive, safe and friendly environment. Adhering to these principles will, I am sure, deliver the success we have on the pitch into our next century. When you do something really important in the club, the members sometimes gather together and say, let's name something in that person's name. Well, here we have the Bill Hogg Room, named after Bill Hogg, who did so much work running the force for over 25 years. Following us around in the clubhouse, what do we have here but the Ian Dewar Bar? Father Dewar, of course, built most of the internals of this club. And this bar has been here since 1970, still as strong as it was when it was first put in. And the other major player in the club honoured, none other than Ramsey Smith. Ramsey, of course, gave over 50 years service to the club and this lounge was named after he passed away in 2008. In 1973, an official league structure was introduced in Scotland by the SRU and Musselburgh were placed into Division 3. Peter Cassidy was captain during this year. However, this was not a season to remember for the club and they were relegated to the 4th Division, losing all their games that year. Jim Drummond was appointed captain the following season. My name's Jim Drummond. I was captain of the club in season 74-75. I played under some really inspiring captains. Jack Stewart, Dot Thomas, Rob Brown, Raymond Clark. I've played with some truly outstanding players. Ramsey Smith, George Patterson, Donnie MacDonald, Clifford Livingston. The club suffered another relegation to Division 5. Whilst 1974-75 may not have been a good year for the first 15, a key moment in Musselburgh's development was the creation of a Colts team. Then I discovered that the whole of the Borders had a Colts team. So I proposed that, that we emulate Circuit Youth Club. Chris Barclay-Smith, president at the AGM of 1976, Address the members to establish what path they would like the club to follow. This led to the appointment of Alex Stewart as coach. I was started the coaching, you know, in the mid-70s, uh, when we had moved down a couple of divisions into the, from the third to the fifth division of the Scottish National Leagues, of which there were six divisions. And we had a fairly young team. Uh, I remember the stalwart we had left from the earlier strong most of the teams who had mainly uh, been retiring and moving away to other areas. So the start of the new leagues was not a good time for Musselburgh. Rob Brown played on and he was tremendous help uh, to me as a coach at the time. The rest of the team were pretty inexperienced and young 
Pope, actually, and we struggled that first year despite working very, very hard uh, throughout the season and we just managed to stay in the fifth division. Thereafter, uh, we managed to, well, well, I remember thinking we'd have to do a different type of work and really sort ourselves out a bit more and be a bit more streetwise because we were playing teams that were quite experienced and some good players in them that had been denied, been denied top level rugby up to that stage because of the structure in Scotland and they were quite keen to show what they could do against teams like Musterbury who were considered a big team. Raymond Clark was captain. Raymond Clark speaking. And in season 76 77, we managed to gain promotion as undefeated champions. I was privileged to be captain that year, the following year, and in the season 83 84. Over the years, there have been many highlights on the playing side, which I remember fondly. But for me, the most significant one, far from the most high profile game that Musselburgh has ever played in. But it was a game which epitomised the change in direction of the club from one in free fall down the leagues to one hungry for success and on the way back up. The game was against Carter Queen's Park. We had to win to go undefeated and win the league and promotion. We managed a fine victory and in doing so let the touch paper for a recovery and descent back up the leagues. The dedication of that particular team was also shown by the fact that two of the players should have been in Wales at the teammates' wedding, but chose to play for the club at this important game and were represented in Wales by their wives. Also in that game was a third player who got married the day before and postponed his honeymoon so that he could play in the game. In the early 1980s, Musselburgh competed in the second or third divisions of the Scottish Leagues. I was lucky enough to have three stints as a captain at Musselburgh. The first was to captain the Colts side and then captaining the club in the 80-81 and the 87-88 seasons. Firstly, I'd like to say how honoured and flattered I am that the club have gone to all this big trouble to celebrate the 40th anniversary of my captaincy. Uh, I was captain season 81. We'd just been promoted from the third division to the second division, so it's the highest the club had been. And we were obviously a wee bit apprehensive how well we'd do there, but um, we held our own, um, did reasonably well there. But probably the, the best success we had was uh, going down to Milltown to play Langham. Langham had never lost a second division game at home. And uh, we went down there and thrashed them 4-0. Hello, my name's Neil Smith. I captained the Muslim Rugby Club in season 1982-83. I'd like to take this opportunity of passing on my congratulations to the club in its centenary year. Over the years, Musselboro has produced a good number of players who have gone on to win representative honours. Uh, so far as I'm concerned, I can just put it down to two of the best years of my life. Uh, coming down from the north of Scotland uh, to join a great bunch of guys in the under-18s, the Stony Hill Stunners, of course. Five of us in the Edinburgh uh, under-18s, two of us in the national, and then two of us going on, up on to under-21s. You know, we had a really good bunch of boys and we, 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 we knocked way above our weight. In 1983, Duncan McMillan was elected president of the club. Well, I was the on committee. Um, we, we were uh, in Division 2 and we got dropped to Division 3. And the club was at an all-time low, seriously all-time low. And uh, Chris Barclay Smith had been out as president and came back in. I mean, he'd had enough. So I was approached and asked to be president. But 
I wasn't sure about it because, as I say, I wasn't even on committee. I, I, I wasn't involved in that the administration of the club. So eventually, I decided I would um, I would have a go at it, and um, that's when I spoke with Donald and Derek, uh, Donald and uh, Raymond, about becoming captain. I wanted to establish captains because far enough me coming in as a, a rookie. As I say, they did it. And Raymond became captain and Donald became vice captain. And that pulled the team together. Two guys with reasonable authority at captain level. And, uh, and we did well that season. In fact, we were third in the league. In the early 80s, the club had been moving up the leagues. And it was felt as though changing across in the community centre was not really conducive with a club going places. Plans were therefore drawn up for the building of a changing facility. John Spaulding was a key character in the design and build of this structure and in 1983 it was ready for use. The whole thing started off by, um, well as you know, we always used to change in the community centre and unless you were off quick the pitch after a training session you got a cold shower. And I always remember Robbie Burrow seemed to be running his fastest to get from the pits to the changing rooms. So we decided that enough was enough. We couldn't spend money on the community centre because it wasn't ours. So we decided we'd try and progress, build an extension on the other side beside the clubhouse. And we also went out to the members to try and get some interest-free loans. So once we'd got all that in place, we felt we could go. <coughs> so I then prepared uh, uh, drawings to... To, for the extension, sort of started to design it. And there was sort of three remits in that, or maybe four. First one was, uh, it had to be structurally sound. So I got uh, Stuart Finlay to look over my drawings and just put some structural element on it. Second one was we had to have loads of hot water. So I got Bill Dosser, who was a non-playing member. Gary Dosser was his wee brother, who did play. Uh, he was a, a mechanical engineer and he designed, uh, told us to use this handworthy it's a huge, big instant water heater. So as long as you've got the hot water tap on, you get hot water, which seemed to be perfect for what we needed. So that was that. So the next thing was we had uh, unbreakable glass in the small windows, more for the players in the changing room breaking the windows rather than vandals outside breaking them. And the last thing was the home changing room had to be bigger than the away changing room for uh, psychological reasons. So. Having got all that sorted out, I got the plans ready, submitted building warrant and planning, and without really much bother, we got through all that. So here we are entering the changing rooms, which have been up since 1983, obviously. Haven't changed much in all this time, but certainly you're going to see a big improvement to what we had at the community centre, and you can imagine why they were built in the first place. So here we have the first one. We're continuing the theme of naming doors and naming rooms. So this is named after Alec Baxter, a very important individual back in the 30s and right the way through to when I, even I joined the club, he was here doing the Colts in 1976. So there we are. So then we go to the home changing room. And as you can see, a lot more space than we had in the community centre. I was fortunate enough to be captain in 1984-85, which was the first season that these changing rooms were in operation. We sort of settled into routine in here. So down in this corner here, you can imagine the strips were all laid up and we started one, two, three. So the front row always were in this area. And it, it was that way all the way through my playing days. I don't know what it is these days, but they were always in here. And then you would move round here up to number eight. So you'd have the the talented people in this area, the back five, and then round here you'd have the girls, oh sorry, the backs. The backs would be here, noisy and chattering away, and then round to here with the substitutes. So this was really good, and in that season, their first full season of using the changing rooms, we won every home league game. So obviously galvanised us into great deeds. So moving on through from the home changing room, we come to the shower room now. After three heads, we now have nine heads of showers. 
And as you can see here, the visitor's changing room is named after Alistair Tarbot, another great servant of the club. Even, the, even though the away changing room, while it's not as spacious as the home changing room, gives plenty of room for everybody to change in. You see there's a, a room for the referees. It's a very small room, and all the, as I say, this will all be improved as we go along. Into this area, and then here, you can imagine this will be set up as the, the doctors in the physio room, uh, ready for treating people should they unfortunately be injured. So the main reason I wanted to bring you into this area, which not many people would really want to see, is that here we have another door with a name on it. Derek's WC. Derek Watson, final back row player for our team, spent most of his pre-game in this cubicle, and as such, this was named in his honour. Time I got an anonymous uh, report from uh, Derek Watson, it was about how before every game, he used to always have to go to the toilet and uh, used to sit there in Hoyks, changing rooms, Gala, Harriet's, and think of all the famous bums that had sat down in the seat that played rugby, which was an inspiration to him. So I went away and got a little sign made up, Derek's WC, and screwed it onto one of the doors of the toilets. Now, on the, on the actual night of the President's 15, I've got uh, two recollections. One is, I remember I was on crutches because I had just had my knee, uh, my cartilage taken out of my knee, having played at Pinky, on my comeback for the force having just broken my collarbone four games before it. Well, so I played, broke my collarbone, played about four games. And so my wife wasn't too pleased with me and my boss wasn't too pleased with me. So that was my first week. But my second recollection is halfway through the night after the game and all that, which all went very well, the president's captain came up to me and says, are you the guy that designed this clubhouse? I said, yeah. He says, there's not a mirror in the way changing rooms. I thought, well, nobody's perfect. So, so that was basically how it all went. So we had gone from losing all our important games to winning the vast majority of our important games and that was a psychological lift. So we went forward the following year, we went, they went forward as a winning team and, um, and the following year they were third again. You know, after they'd been first, so they became first, got promoted to Division yeah. 2. And they went forward in Division 2 and they were third in the league again, which again suited me, because here we were. Hi, I'm Robert Burroughs and was fortunate to be captain of the club in 1985-86. I wish the club every success for the future. 1987 would prove to be the club's finest year. A win against Edinburgh Wanderers on the 28th of February would be enough for the club to be promoted to the top division for the first ever time. Back in the one other side, bubbling about, and Andy McLeod goes piling on there, did well. Coming back, well done. That's beautiful laid back there. Wee dummy coming around, goes cutting through the gap. It's a great run here now. Barney are going the wrong way, son. Yes, that's a lovely score. Well done. Oh, I thought he'd gone the wrong way there. I couldn't quite see if they were going to manage to link. Malcolm Smith was the man who took the final pass. And nipped in the My best memory of that I'm season sure was, was at the final whistle of the Edinburgh Wanderers game. And we knew we were promoted to Division 1. And almost immediately the celebrations started and went on for quite a long time. Aside from the league, the club also enjoyed success on the seventh circuit. Whilst winning such tournaments as Peebles and Walkerburn, there was no sign of a victory in our own tournament. The last victory there had been in 1957. That all changed in 1987. Of all my fond memories at the club, one of the, the fondest would be the time I was a member of the team that managed to win the Brunton Cup and bring Musselburgh's own sevens tournament trophy back to the club for the first time in 30 years. Clifford are pushing up, round to Donald who's looping across to Kevin. Nicely done. 
they're pushing across the defence, Kevin outside him, comes away this way, right through the middle, so in he goes. Lads catching him, I think a wee bit twist and turn and hopefully, no. Yes, he'll be getting the score for that. He should get the score for that, actually. Our personal highlights were getting promoted to Division 1 and playing in Division 1 and being in the most of seven that uh, won the own, its own tournament in 1987 for the first time in 30 years. Well, that that one almost meant more to me than getting promoted to First Division, actually, because we've been played so many times in our own sevens and never won it, and it was yeah, a right. great day. And Drew wouldn't want to run that distance. Barney won't run, no Derek says I'll run myself. No, I can't catch him. I'll run Derek, that's him knackered for the day, but a uh, nice score. I mean, the, the sevens that when we started playing, we, I enjoyed it. Well, I, I want to folks say it, probably I've played better sevens or fifteens at the time. I enjoyed it because we had a, a, a genuine mix, the experienced boys that were good sevens players the threes included, and we could mix and match, put the pig in and other boys in. And I was fortunate I could go through, because then I come on to play with Kenny Patterson, uh, what do you call him, uh, with Stuart Campbell. And they went on doing the boys, Alan Duncan, must have been produced good sevens in it. But I remember the very first one we won was Peebles. Well covered with Portobello, but the boys are going. He's not offside there, unfortunately. Drew Johnson goes in again to Donald, out to Barney. Surely they get in here. Neil goes in. Well done. I'll put that down to Drew Johnson again. By God, he did a tremendous dive and secured that ball. He's Can you remember running out for our own sevens? That the banking was full. There was people right round the pitch. I mean, it was just—it was a fantastic day. The first ever top flight campaign kicked off against Stuart's Melville at Stony Hill. I remember it as being, uh, uh, well, it was the opening match of the season and we'd, the previous season, we'd, uh, we'd done pretty well. We ended up third, I think, Jim. Um, mm -hmm. Hyatt won it and we, we, we narrowly lost to Heriot's and Heri I think Heriot's got second. Anyway, we, we finished third and you guys... But we were fourth, sorry. Was it fourth in the end? But we were yeah. fourth. Right. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. And then... Um, Musselburgh had just been promoted, hadn't they? And so uh, it was the opening match of the season at Stony Hill. And uh, so we were, you know, reasonably confident, you know, having had a good season the season before. And Barney, Barney had whipped us up, meeting at his house beforehand. Um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, uh, uh, so yeah, we were, we were quite well. Uh, we, we had a bit of a blow. Dougie Wiley couldn't play at standoff, I remember. And uh, so the boy uh, Dunn played, didn't he, Jim? The, um, Malcolm Dunn. Is that hey, Alistair Dunn. Aye, aye. And anyway, Christ, we scraped a draw in the end. We, we hung on yeah, there. Yeah. Neil Meldon out into wing of tea, Stuart Higginbottom, playing him inside centre, which surprises me a little. Well done, Donald. A good long ball. If it's, it's an injured man outside, yes, of course. Oh. Yes, he's in. Well done. Lovely score. Lovely score by Neil Meldrum coming up on the outside. Dear life in the end, I think. In fact, Donald, I think you... Did you convert or did you miss a conversion from the touchline to, to win? From the touchline to draw it. Yeah. I think Is I kicked it, it from the touchline. Kicked line. it to draw. Yeah, that's it. Those were the he days as well. Like draw. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have kicking tees. And Stony Hill, the grass was about a foot and a half long. So that was deliberate to stop your free-flowing running game. It's too mel, you see. This <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, I have seen the video, actually, and you can only see the top half of the ball when I'm trying to kick the conversion. Is that right? Is it yeah, just that right? Yeah. And I'll be, I'll be honest, that our touch judge, uh, Ross Jimison, on the day, he, was, he always uh, kind of recalls a story. He Put says, his flag up. Guys, you guys are all behind the post, and I'm taking the conversion. And the chat was basically, well, it's it's almost on the touchline. It's on his wrong side. He'll probably miss it. Oh, well done. What a lovely kick. Sir. And then all you heard was one of your guys mm. going, the wee bastards kicked it. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, that's a great play. A win against Kilmarnock followed. Well done, well done. 
With a narrow loss to Muir and a great win at home versus West of Scotland, the team was off to a good start. I was trying to remember, was it mid-80s you were in the first division, was that right? Yeah, played at Golden Acre in a league match. Um, 88. That's the mm -hmm. one, Derek, where Kenny kicked Ryan Shuttle. Uh, kicked Shuttle. Quite Shuttle. 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 I've gone through this a hundred <laughs> times, Donald. The muscle, I think the, one of the, the guy who's filming for Musselburgh shouts, uh, or the referee is saying, because Derek Watson apparently swung a punch at me, you see, and the referee pulled Derek aside and penalised him. And the muscle biased Musselburgh commentator <laughs> on the camera is saying, and Derek Watson's getting explained that had he not done that, the penalty would have been for Musselburgh. But that's nonsense, because the referee never blew his hat, the whistle, and pointed to Musselburgh first and then reversed it to, to Heriots. He pointed it straight to Heriots. So it's just that thuggest play of that back it, it, forward. It Derek Watson, but... too much here, I think. That, that video you were talking about, Kenny, um, I'm actually accrediting myself with starting the move because just after that penalty, we, had, we got the ball back and we went sort of half the length of the pitch and scored. And it all started no. off with our commentator saying, Heriot's won the ball back. So, oh, and Donald's missed that tackle. <laughs> but we went on to score, so I'm claiming yeah, credit for it. starting the move. I'm lost in the one two, but it'll suit us. There it comes the ball, and Val has it, clears it. Now, if we do get something here. Well done, Neil. Right through, needs somebody outside him. Gonna, Neil gonna get Despite some close matches, the team only managed one more victory against yeah, Ayr. However, a big win against Watsonians on the final day could be enough to stay up. Start with that, start with that 1987 88 game. What, what do you remember of that game, boys? My last game for Sonians. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, end. Of, it must have been spring. Well, probably yeah, sort of March time, eighty, eighty eight. We must have played a game there, and uh, I think because um, Derek keeps reminding me, I think I kicked a penalty from about forty odd yards, and it put Musselburgh back down in, into the second division. I think. Is the that one, right? If, the one thing you've missed there, you and is the report in the paper. I think I. I, had, I hunted out the, all the old stuff from up in the attic and it said um, a, a last minute penalty from you and Kennedy went in off the upright to give the visitors oh. an undeserved victory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't realise that. But, uh, I just remember, Derek's, Derek's reminded me about it every time we've tied up ever since. That well, the last, it was virtually the last kick of the game and it was my last, my last kick for Watsonians, my last game for Watsonians. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, my wife obviously had a car accident not long after that, and uh, it kind of hastened hastened my uh, early departure from uh, from Myerside. So uh, I remember f all about that game. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd probably been out the night before. I right? <laughs> you and uh, you and I can only think that I can't have been playing in that game because uh, a if it was in March '88, I know right. I'd started a job down in London in that That's January. And secondly, surely I would have been kicking, and I would have, <laughs> well, and I wouldn't have needed that. to use one of the ghosts to get the ball over the over the bar. Well, my most embarrassing muscle, uh, Watsonian experience was year as captain. Uh, to be fair, Watsonians were really good. They, even when we were down in the fifth division, they used to always play in friendlies, and year as captain in the second division, but we played Sonians under the lights. Yeah, that was always the, the traditional fixture, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Were like that I don't Hill. think you're playing Scott. I think you're still in Newcastle then. But yeah. you and David Johnson, Gavin, Fobo, Kenny Johnson, Smith, Backley. I think I was still putting my gum shield in when Ryan Robertson was scoring in the corner. <laughs> he scored four tries that night. We we're forty nil down at half time. I thought, Jesus. Uh, I think it was about sixty nil in the end. But it was one of my most oh. awesome rugby experiences. Awful. Here, innovative we were, Scott. We had floodlights before we had a clubhouse. Well, I know that. No, I, well, I was going to say traditionally, what Sonians always used to have a fixture about the turn of the year under the floodlights. It was always a good welcome. The pitch was always in pretty good nick as well, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't always the case. It was it was called Stony Hill for a reason. It was an absolute <laughs> disaster of a place when we first moved there in the fifties. Right. Um, it was terrible, but we, we did a lot of work on it over the years. It's, I, I think it's pretty decent, actually. It's a good place to play rugby. It used to be an absolute nightmare at the end of the season with the Sevens tournament. 
dust bowl sevens. Oh, honestly, you couldn't you couldn't even get the the, the, the ball in the ground to have a kick at goal. Um, it was that hard, was it? Absolute nightmare. You played sevens before with, kicking tees as well, right? Yeah, you played sevens with knee bandages on, and it was only to stop taking the skin off your knees, etc. When you pretended you were trying to make a tackle, you know that one where you, you dive and try to flick the heel or something like that. <laughs> I know. What what was Musburger's reputation like when they first went up to the first division, guys? Did did you get? I mean, we were. I think we were trying to play a really fast, flowing game of rugby because our forwards were tiny for 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 starters. But would we played what sort of twice? That was it only 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 playing each team once at that stage. Only yeah. the once. Yeah. Only the once. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can back you up on that one before these guys get a chance to answer. I remember going down for a, you know, to Mansfield Park to play Hoyk, and the very first line out, Drew, our current president, was our um, was our ace in the pack, our biggest forward, our tallest man at six foot two, and we stood at the first line out, and their entire back five in their pack dwarfed Drew, and I just <laughs> thought to myself, how the f are we going to win a line out all game? I mean, it's virtually impossible. But to be fair, the coach at the time did kind of work our game a bit around the way Stu Mel used to do it shortened line outs, quick line outs. Everything was just, you know, rather than slow it down and set piece and standard play, we tried to mix it up and it, we got away with it a lot of the time. What, what, what was it like, guys? Because you, you obviously got promoted in the top division. You said you had a light pack, you did throw the ball around. And uh, what was the old coach called? Was it Rayton? Was it Rayton? Russell. Russell, Russell Scott, we played it a bit like what Sony used to be honest with you. I yeah. remember what club that special use always had a great back line and kind of go beat up front when you went doing this the thing with but yourself, David Johnson. And Derek talked about that game. I was my young boy, I went up and watched David Johnston. I thought he was the most elegant runner you'd ever see running with a ball. He mm. just never seemed to do anything, but he'd he glide by folk at just the ease. So yeah. we tried quick and sharp, but as soon as the heavy weather come in. That was it. It was kind of, they kind of knew it muscle us and it become harder and harder. It didn't help Clifford that, um, I, th I think Russell always tells the story that he videoed us against somebody and did Barney not ask to see the video or something after we'd played? And he just gave it Barney to the video and Barney handed the video to Borough Muir and they sat down and had a look at it and said, screw <laughs> them up front, boys. <laughs> <laughs> You and, um, what, what, what was it? What was the story? But what was the story behind the kicking competition? I remember that. Back what in the, the stats? I've got. I've got that. By the way, uh, just like, the stats oh, the no, I can't no, no. We were raising the way to Canada. He's got his stats. Got the stats here. Attempts on the night: Hastings fifty-two, fourteen successful. <laughs> Twenty-six percent. I think you ought to start apologising to Mister. You in there, eh? Yeah, exactly. My attempt for 59, 14, 23%. But the boy writes in this, the best thing of the night is Livingston, Clifford kicked a penalty from the halfway line. Hastings couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you and you kicked one for the halfway line, son. Tell him. I did. I did. Yeah, it was wrong right. too. You could that? manage it at Stony Hill, but you could manage it at my side, Gavin. Can you remind me? Was this not like a Monday night? Was it not it was, just it was reason, it was reason it money for Canada, like Gavin. a gale? And it was, you know, probably leading into an international, and it was the oh, last here time. We go. Oh, you know, here we go. This is the doctor, one of the Gavin Hastings excuse book. You're probably <laughs> right, Gav, because Don, Donald organised it. It was meant to be checking you were meant to be coming up. And Chick obviously looked at his window and says, I'm not gone. <laughs> Donald says you have to play Gav the night, but it was a hellish night, it was. It was. <laughs> and we took 50 odd kicks, did we? Yeah. 50 odd kicks each. You yeah. don't ever remember kicking as many goals as that in a practice session. So there must have, I think it was obviously, it must have been timed and we were desperate to get into the clubhouse as quickly as possible or something like that. Oh, I love the, I love the way that Cliff had all those stats stuffed up in his bed. Eh? I'll tell you, in this day and age though, in this pro, pro era, boys, with stats like that, uh, you know, you and would have been yeah. kicking the following week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Is it you that organised that kicking thing, Donald? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Somebody said that, uh, I think it happened at some other club and we were trying to raise funds. As Drew said, we were raising funds to Tour Canada. So I had asked um, Chick Chalmers and Gav if they would come down 
uh, you know, and uh, Gavin was the only one to turn up. I see. Okay. Turn up. I turn up. That's one thing. I might not be very good, but at least I turn up. <laughs> 1992 saw a highlight for the club, where 59 members toured Canada. To you all at the Mighty Mighty Borough, uh, my name's Alan McCall, uh, also affectionately known by some of my ex clubmates as Sandy, much to my annoyance over the years. Uh, I was club captain at Musselburgh between the seasons 91 to 93, uh, and I've got to say the highlight in my time at Musselburgh over the many seasons I was there would be the 92 93 season, which just started with our pre season tour to Canada. Uh, which was a tremendous success both on and off the field and prepared us for a, a great season ahead uh, in the leagues. Off field, I've got to say that the time over there, the stories, the adventures, the memories uh, that were made and also the days white water rafting uh, were unbelievable uh, and will live with me forever. Uh, the 92-93 season itself, uh, Great season, some great rugby. Winner takes all was the name of the game as Musselburgh played Stuart's Melville at Inverleith. Yeah, I quite enjoyed that morning actually because uh, BBC Radio Scotland did a, a, prog a programme, a guy called Ian Anderson who did a bit of uh, commentary work I think for STV as well. He had a morning rugby, rugby show so Alec and myself were called into uh, the BBC offices in uh, in, I think it was George George Street in Edinburgh, or uh, yeah, George George Street it was. So they got us on quite early. I think we had to be there for nine o'clock in the morning. So uh, I had to get my breakfast early before the big match. And uh, Alec and I were interviewed. And I do remember the guy Ian Anderson saying, asking who who he thought from the Sue Mill side would uh, they, should, they should maybe watch out for. And I said there was a young guy at, at number ten called Wiley who uh, <laughs> you know uh, who may, maybe worth having a, having a, having a look at, but. Uh, no, in all seriousness, it was it was actually quite a nice way to start to start the day, and uh, I suppose in a way it got us both both pretty much focused, you know. So.
<laughs> I managed to sneak over for the uh, try to, towards the end at Zoom Victory, and uh, yeah, it was very much relief relief for us. Although I don't know, I don't know if we deserved it particularly on the day. And I'm not just saying not just saying that, but uh, yeah. uh, so it was very much a sense of relief from from our side our side at Zoom L anyway. Yeah. <laughs> We did not know at the time that it would be another long wait before top flight rugby was on the minds of the borough.